Hey guys, welcome back to We Talk Money. We are back in the studio. Woo-hoo! Got Nikki, certified financial planner, and Travis, institutional grade stock investor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your host, Chris Dunn. How have you guys been, man? It's been, uh, what, a, a, at least a month or two since we've been in the studio. Yeah, I'm loving it that we're back here. It's so much easier to talk to people in person than through Zoom for some reason. Do you guys yeah. have Zoom fatigue yet? Oh, yeah. Yes. 100%. Over it. Over Even it. though their stock is up like, what? 50, 40% or 40%? something. Right yeah, now, man, they just had a massive whatever. gap. What happened, Trav? Well, they have blowout earnings for Q2. Revenue up 335% year over year. Absolutely mind-blowing. Market cap now pushing, I think, $130 billion or so. And, and when they IPO, they, it was what, like 10 or $20 billion or something like that? Yeah, it was, yeah. It's, I That's think insane. It's been uh, close to a 10-bagger since IPO. Yeah. Pretty wild. I mean, what, what do we call this episode? So I think you guys said earlier, bubblicious. Bubblicious. <laughs> There's just bubbles all over the place. Oh, and yes. A bubble just here, Just frothiness bubble there. and excitement and like, what the hell is going on? Stocks only go up, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going Stonks on. Stonks only go up. <laughs> Stocks, crypto. You've got yeah, lots DeFi. of IPOs. DeFi. Yeah. Spacks, yeah. Even metals are up right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. You can't lose. I mean, what pandemic? <laughs> no. you. Yeah. I mean, even bonds have been up i mean it's crazy yeah. yeah yeah i mean so much to to cover i guess we could jump into the the DeFi stuff real quick i know a lot of people probably have questions about that i mean this is just i hate to say that part of it is like you know kind of gives me uh memories and a little ptsd from the 2017 ico boom and bust you know where people just start chasing easy gains and that's how a lot of people lose money um but one thing i will say about this that is very interesting and i think does have meat to it and sustainability is decentralized exchanges this is something that i've been really bullish on the past few years but we really haven't seen much growth and real trading volume and liquidity up until recently um, if I jump over, so we've been stuck with like Coinbase basically. Yeah. Yeah. Like Coinbase has been dominating and you can see here in July, this is the aggregate monthly volume for decentralized trading platforms, right? So this is like all of them and you can see really it got kicking in July and then August it, it's really taken off. So we've had over a hundred billion, uh, in volume last month. And, uh, actually as of the other day, uh, we had Uniswap, which is the top DEX or decentralized exchange that actually uh, traded higher volumes than Coinbase. So that's pretty huge. That's significant. It feels like this could be one of those moments in the asset class where there's going to be, you know, a huge shift and a huge potential like uh, movement coming from this that creates lots of downstream effects as well. So, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and for anybody that doesn't know, a decentralized exchange is kind of what it sounds like. It's an exchange where there is no third party custodial risk, right? Like your risk with Coinbase or any of the other dozens of crypto exchanges is that they could get hacked and lose your coins, meaning in their infrastructure or your personal account through them could get hacked or they could do an exit scam or whatever. With this, you're, you're literally peer to peer trading through the interwebs, right? And so there's less counterparty risk. Um, and it, it starts to challenge the traditional way that we think about brokerages and exchanges and stuff. Like, you know, no longer do you really need to think about KYC, which is another huge breaking point. Uh, and there's pros and cons with this, but I mean, this is, I think, a wave that is only going to continue to grow. Well, I mean, this is why people love crypto so much, right? In the first place. So of course, yeah. this seems like the next natural progression to really have that widespread adoption. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, again, this is something that is uh, not risk free. I mean, you, you really have to make sure that you're trading real coins. There are scams that happen on this as well. And I would just encourage everybody right now the, the, right now we're kind of at fever pitch of like FOMO hysteria. Like we had uh, yearn. So yearn.finance, um, which is th- this went from, I think six bucks to like $35,000. Wow. And yeah, so it, we've got a lot of FOMO right now in this space, and there have been some really big gains. We've had some big trades on some of the DeFi tech um, over the past couple of weeks, you know, Compound um, and 
some of the like Kyber network we've been in, a lot of the decentralized exchanges and infrastructure built around this whole decentralized movement. Um, but you got to be careful, right? So if we look at Yearn and you start to see prices, let's just pull up Polo here. So you can see, I mean, this is basically went from nothing up to thirty-five dollars to $40,000. And just over the past week, so here on August 28th, that went from 15K to over 40K. When you start to see these kinds of moves, hopefully you understand for the guys and ladies that have been following us that you don't buy parabolic moves that have gone that high that fast, right? These things crash, these things pull back, um, and there is an extra layer of risk to this. So yeah, you can trade it, but be very disciplined with your risk management on it because you can also lose everything. Like we saw with Yam a couple weeks ago, like something that imploded in two days and, you know, gotta and, be careful. And, you know, just a general principle, I think for investing, no matter what the asset class is, is if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And that actually probably applies even outside of investing. But, you know, there's a lot of things that will pop out of this too when you have moves like this where you'll have affiliates who start coming out with all kinds of scams. You know, we saw in the 2017 ICO boom, of course, there was a bunch of ICO scams. So I don't even know what all the types of scams that will come out of this will be. But certainly, <laughs> like, when you get something real with real volume behind it, like the the DEX is, there's, there's going to be really great fundamental changes, but there's also going to be a bunch of scammers come yeah, out to try yeah. to scam people. Yeah. Everything from the impersonators and the copiers to, you know, hackers and, and whatnot, like you just got to be really careful. Um, but this is something I'm really excited about and I, we're going to talk a lot more about over the next few weeks. Awesome. So, yeah, um, yeah man. So uh, that's it. You know, Uniswap uh, obviously taking the cake here, but there are some others that are really competing heavily. Um, I like Kyber Network as far as like exchange um, diversification. So what I mean by that is like I like tokens that change uh, that trade on multiple exchanges. So you can see like this one's on Coinbase, uh, Binance, Wobi, uh, Kraken, right? Like I really am just not a fan of tokens that only trade on like Binance, right? Or only trade on a decentralized exchange. As far as like being a trader and investor, I've just noticed that the more sustainable trends come from stuff that can actually trade in multiple places. You get different liquidity pools and stuff like that. So makes sense. One is the loneliest number. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the stock market, dude, which is Ooh. just, I mean. In fuego. Does you know. it ever stop? I don't know. <laughs> Looking at the NASDAQ, <laughs> fresh highs today, Good September grief. 1st. <laughs> it's kind of getting annoying at this point, to be honest. I, but that happens to me all the time. When, and you guys are making money. How can you be annoyed? Well, no, I know. I know. But we make money because of the corrections and the panics and the pullbacks. Like, yeah. that's where the money is made, really. Yeah, yeah. you harvest up here, but you yeah. then you get short of things to buy when you're up here so yeah and you're you know yeah sure you're you're you have gains you can harvest and that's great happy about that but <laughs> the market needs a healthy correction it's healthy it's good for long-term trends to have pullbacks mm -hmm. yep. and i don't know i'd like to see one but yeah, i don't I know mean, if it'll ever come <laughs> the, the s p 500 just hit a, a new all-time high last week too so i don't know what do you guys make of this it's a continuation of the same trends we've been seeing over the past couple of months, which is, you know, big tech momentum. It's all continuing to work. You know, a lot of the more traditional value plays not working as well. Some sectors still not getting any love like financials or travel, things like that. Yep. But if you're a tech stock, you're a momentum stock, you've had the momentum and you, you're still going like Tesla feels like it goes up every day. I don't know when the last time it had a down day. Was. I think Wait, it what, was what down earlier. Day, maybe. Down, yeah. Wait, what, what do you mean? Tesla was two thousand dollars. <laughs> Today it's five hundred. What happened? It's down seventy five percent. No. Oh, stock splits. What a that's oh, been a yes. topic in the news. So it yeah, has. This is actually the first red day in Tesla I've seen in a long time. <laughs> yeah. they, did, they did announce an equity offering, which is the smart thing for the company to do. Yeah, they're they, going to raise what five billion. They want to sell five billion. It's an interesting type of offering. It's called an at the market offering or an. ATM offering and basically and you know when companies raise capital typically in a secondary sale they'll go to the investment bank they'll line up a bunch of institutional buyers they'll set a price and then they'll sell those shares but in this one they're doing an ATM offering which is what a lot of like shadier bio uh, biotech or small cap stocks do when they're really in need of capital and it's essentially an agreement with the banks that says we're going to sell at any given time over this time window which could be a couple weeks to a couple months 
at whatever the prevailing price is in the market, we're gonna sell up to X amount of shares. And so that's what Tesla is doing here. And basically what this suggests to me is there's not a bunch of institutional buyers lined up to buy Tesla stock at these prices. So they're just gonna sell stock into the market to retail investors or whoever's out there buying. So they literally just dump the shares on the open market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But from Tesla's standpoint, it's very smart because they're gonna raise five billion of fresh capital at these really high valuations with the stock up here, yeah. which will allow them to delever the balance sheet or invest in growth initiatives without taking too much dilution to the existing shareholders. So pretty smart of them to take advantage of this parabolic share price. But yeah, they're basically selling into the market over the next however many days and weeks. Well, cause wasn't that the, the, I guess the big risk or the fear w before Tesla had its breakout when it was in its basically multi-year range down here, um, was the fact that maybe they won't be able to raise capital and they're going to run out of cash and they have so much debt. So it's almost like the, the higher stock price is like self-fulfilling where this alone could help them survive. That's right. George Soros famously called this reflexi a reflexivity. Reflexivity, am I saying <laughs> that right? Reflexiveness. Yeah. And it basically means, you know, a higher share price can actually lead to an even higher share price in the future, which is a little weird, right? These things sort of have a self-reinforcing mechanism. And it's like you said, because it takes the bear case of Tesla running out of capital off the table. Yeah. They can raise 5 billion, take a lot of that debt off the balance sheet and just give them a fresh cash pile. It eliminates the, the kind of downside to zero scenario, assuming there's not something like fraud, which that's a whole nother conversation. But yeah, this is actually something that raises the floor I think of the the valuation that Tesla could trade down to potentially. So that is, uh, again, I think a pretty smart play from the company to take advantage of this type of valuation. But yeah, Soros famously that the idea that a reflexivity can mean in a higher share price then leads to another higher share price is, is so true with Tesla. Buying begets more buying That's begets right. more buying. So I think we should just clearly clear the air or quickly clear the air about stock split yeah <laughs> yeah let's Can talk about what please? that is yes for okay. anybody that doesn't know what is a stock split let me ask you a question yeah if i give you a pizza and okay. it's not cut up yep you have a one pizza. pizza like a large pizza yes a big old pie okay. yeah okay it's not cut up yep if i cut it into eight slices I have eight pizzas. <laughs> I got eight times the How pie. How many pizzas do you have? <laughs> you still have the same pizza. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's just, there's just so much. I know that people are out there like cracking jokes about it. And, you know, there's a lot of people that don't really understand fully what a stock split yeah. means. And I just wanted to clear the air. So explain what, what is a stock split? Well, it's essentially you're taking your one share and you're getting multiple shares, but for the same share, they're just cutting that share into pieces, basically right. the same share. They're just cutting it into pieces for you. So two to one, if you get double the amount of shares, say you have a thousand, now you have 2000, but then the stock price gets cut in half as well. That's so right. it'll go from a hundred to 50. So yeah. really nothing has changed. You just cut the pizza into smaller. Right. Yeah. Slices. But a lot of people didn't understand that. And they were actually like, I got messages from people that were like, should I buy? I'm going to get more shares. And I'm like, you don't understand. Like, okay, sure. Maybe there's that there is the philosophy that if the share price is lower, more people, more investors are going to be attracted to buy it. But yeah. fractional shares kind of threw that out the window. I mean, anybody can Good take a hundred bucks and put it into Tesla and not have to buy a full share, right? So um, yeah, just people were really confused about that. And then you have that, what's his name? David? David, po or, David uh, Por uh, Port Dave Portnoy, yeah. yeah. Dave Portnoy, he's out there hooting and hollering about, you know, <laughs> His, you get more pizza. You get more pizza. To I no slice brainer. it up and I got more pizza. It's math. <laughs> and I'm like, he's trolling. I'm, I mean, he's yeah. probably trolling, <laughs> but some people believe this stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously they did because when they announced the split, the stock went insane. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And there is some argument to be made that perhaps by splitting the stock. And again, like you said, when you split the stock, everyone gets uh, more shares, but the share price, the share price is adjusted downward so your total value of your shares should stay constant but because the share price per share is lower there is an argument to be made that maybe perhaps it makes it more attractive for smaller investors it mm -hmm. gives investors a way to granularly sell just a little bit rather than having to sell all their stake at once yeah like you said fractional shares kind of takes that off the table a little bit yeah but but do all brokers offer fractional no, shares that's no I, I, yeah not yet 
most of the big ones most have big started guys. moving in that direction though. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, and when until that is fully rolled out among all the brokers, there is still a little bit of an argument to be made that like the price per share being lower does allow the shares to be marketed to more uh, smaller time investors. You know, we can look at an opposite example of this, like Berkshire Hathaway class A shares, which have never split. And so over time, as the company's value increased, I think it's BRK.A, as the company company's value has increased over 30, 40, 50 years, the price per share has gone up, but the company never split it. So the cost of one share is now astronomically high. It's like $325,000 yeah. for one share. Oh, that's it? Yeah. But <laughs> the, the key is though, you need to think about that valuation of the company still, yeah. the market cap of the company, yeah. right? Like that's it's not really what matters. changing and that's what matters. So yeah. if you're buying Tesla at the current market cap or if you're buying Apple at the current market cap, you know, that's what, that's what you need to be thinking about. Yeah, not yeah. how many shares. Well, a lot of a lot of crypto traders gonna... and investors get screwed on that too. Um, you know, back uh, a few years ago when Bitcoin was like call it ten or fifteen thousand bucks, you had Ripple, which was three dollars, and it was in the top ten list. And so a lot of people thought, or no, sorry, it was thirty cents. And so they were like, oh, this is a deal. And then like even at three dollars, when CNBC was pumping ripple yeah i remember <laughs> you know that. a lot of people mom and pop investors looked at that and went oh yeah three bucks compared to fifteen thousand. you know of course i'm gonna buy the lower yeah. priced one not knowing that there were infinitely more coins and so the market cap was overvalued and, and yeah and i totally understand why mom and pop investors would think that way yeah but it's just it it, it can um it can be a big misunderstanding i know you've talked about this you've done a video on this on your youtube that's right you know about not focusing so much on the stock price yeah. as much as the valuation and the market cap. It's yeah, a low price per share does not mean that the company is valued at a cheap level. It doesn't mean it's it's low because they could have tens of billions of shares outstanding. So mm -hmm. I use an example, I think, in that video on my Stock Geek TV YouTube channel of two different companies, one trading at $4 per share, one trading at $400 per share. But the $4 per share company actually has a much higher market cap in valuation. I think it had like a $20 billion market cap once you yep. multiply by the yeah. number of outstanding shares. Yeah. Whereas the $400 per, per share price company had a $5 billion market cap because it only had a few million shares outstanding. So yeah, you want to pay attention to that. Look at Tesla today. It's trading at a $500 billion diluted, fully diluted market cap or roughly thereabouts. Ooh. So, Ooh. you know, obviously Tesla doing a lot of interesting things, but now has a value market cap value that's greater than all of the other major automakers in the world combined. Volkswagen, Toyota, Ford, GM, Hyundai, all those, you put all those together and they are less than Tesla. And so you say, oh, well, Tesla's the future. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Are they going to take 100% of the, of the car market? No. So you got to just be aware of what you're buying today. If you're buying shares right now of Tesla, you're buying it at a $500 billion valuation. So, so how short of the stock are you? Oh, I would never. No, no, no. I have been on record for, for yeah. many years now saying that I don't, as much as I it's haven't believed mission. in the Tesla story and, and I perhaps should have, but I would not be short because, you know, I learned my lesson long ago that you can't get in front of stocks like these that are, that have these strong cult followings and that have such great price momentum. Never underestimate the irrationality of the masses. That's right. right? Like you never know how crazy stuff could go. That's yeah. right. Yep. Even crypto, you know, Bitcoin, urine, right? Like all these things that, you know, I learned this lesson the hard way back in like 2013 to 15, like never underestimate what crypto can do. And it, it goes similar, like you said, with cult stocks, like stuff can just get driven to insane valuations. When you got Wall Street bets, I saw a guy post the other day, he's like, yeah, I turned 50K into over a million, posted a little screenshot. It's like, all, all hail, you know, uh, King Elon or whatever, right? <laughs> like, you know what, though? If anybody's making this kind of money with buying Tesla, good on them, right? Just know when to... Know when to take some profit. Take some profit. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. 99%, you see those people that make a lot of money, they end up giving it all back. Yeah. It's like people that go on hot runs at the blackjack table. Most of them are going to lose over time. Yeah. It's not until you take the chips and put it somewhere else yeah. that you actually keep it. That's and it's right. euphoric and it feels good and it's like, oh, this is going to go on forever and ever, but just try to like bring yourself in a little bit on yeah, that Yeah, even the greatest companies in the world, they don't go up every day. They don't, they're, they're price charts when they go parabolic, you know, that doesn't last forever. So you've got to be careful and 
even if you have a longer term view that's still very positive on the company, even if you're looking at a $500 billion market cap and saying, well, they're going to be 1 trillion one day, maybe so, but yep. over what time frame? how many things have to go right for that company over the next decade or two for that to actually be true? And what is your return if all of that really unlikely stuff does happen? Well, you double your money. Okay. Well, that's over a 10 year time frame, not that great of a return. So for me, that's why I'm, I'm still hunting the future 10 baggers out there, as opposed to getting too focused on these parabolic stocks in the current market. Yeah. yeah it's easy to get excited and chase what the herd is doing, but that's not how you make money over the long term. It's yeah. where you find those quiet niches, the sleepers, right? Yeah. The sleeping giants. Oh, yeah. 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 You want to catch, you want to catch the Teslas of the world when they're, you know, trading at a, tenth or a hundredth of what they could be. Yeah. Or like Nikki, you got a uh, square here at nine in hindsight. I mean, that's just like the beast mode. That, that, is this that your biggest the, trade this, ever? This will be the best trade of my career for sure. <laughs> if I can beat this, oh. I don't know. I don't know. Hey, if you I never can. know. Don't underestimate. Yourself. I know. Don't I know. I We'll see. But yes, I'm very happy with Square. Nice. Mm -hmm. What are some other ones that uh, you guys have had recently or just some other examples you want to talk about? Either overly exuberant bubbles or stuff that's just taken off now or recent good trades? What I'm going to call Travis out because SPAC, in the SPAC world, he bought TRNE like right before they announced. <laughs> he literally was like an investigator with this shit. He was <laughs> nice. like... You know, yeah, they're, they're going to have, you know, 18 months. They had so many months. And then, you know, this long, how, this is how long has passed. An acquisition has to happen, like, soon. And sure as shit, like, <laughs> he bought it and boom. Okay, so, A, what is a SPAC for anybody that's going, what, a sp slap SPAC. what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so what's a SPAC? What's TR&E? What, what's the, what's yeah. the play? I think this is a good teaching moment. Absolutely, yeah, SPACs. SPAC is short for special purpose acquisition company. These types of, they're, they're also referred to as blank check companies. And basically you get an entrepreneur or a management team that says, Hey, investors, give us a couple hundred million dollars. Give us two years to go out and make a good acquisition. We're going to acquire a company. We don't know what it is yet, but we're going to look at a bunch of different companies, acquire one for hopefully a reasonable price. That's an exciting growth company. And then it will become public as part of our, our blank check company. So our blank check company with a bunch of money will buy this other company. This other company will then become the thing that you own and it will trade publicly. And that's essentially what a SPAC is. And there's been an explosion in SPACs this year. And in the last, I'd call it 18 months, you've got even famous people like politicians. Now, Paul Ryan has got a SPAC. He's trying to raise a couple hundred million dollars for you have Bill Ackman raising a multi-billion dollar SPAC. You have lots of other capital allocators raising SPACs as well and hedge fund managers and private equity firms. So uh, Chamath, of course, he had the Virgin Galactic SPAC. SPCE, right? Yeah, yeah SPCE. Then there was Nikola, Nikola, which was a formerly a blank check company that ended up buying Nikola, took that public. Yeah. Uh, DraftKings was another one that was taken public via SPAC. So very hot space right now. A lot of company companies that have raised money that's just sitting there waiting to acquire something so what's interesting about a SPAC is if they don't acquire something you often get your money back if you're just buying the common stock in the SPAC or you get close to what you paid for it so in a downside scenario if they don't acquire anything you kind of get your money back but in the upside if they acquire an exciting business at a reasonable price like with SPCE or something like that then you can see pretty big gains from where you bought it so Anyway, we've had this explosion of SPACs. There's all different types of SPACs you can invest in right now. Even Chamath now has two other SPACs, IPOB and IPOC. But what I find interesting is, you know, your money can sit there for 18 to 24 months while they're looking for a deal doing nothing. I like to find SPACs that are led by really good management teams that can get good companies. They can add value to those companies once they acquire them. And they're relatively close to an acquisition. So TRNE is one that entered my radar a couple of months ago, doing some work on it. The CEO and founder of it is a guy, Leo Hendry, who was really famously a great executive in the cable business in the 90s, 80s and 90s, created massive amount of value at a company called TCI, which eventually got bought out. But really, really good capital allocator, really smart businessman. He had, he had started this SPAC TRNE try and acquisition about, about 18 months, 12 to 18 months ago, I believe. I think it was March 2019. And their time to do the acquisition was essentially through late this year, early next year was like the end date. Mm. And they had expected originally to do a deal in the first year. So I knew that the clock had been ticking for a while. They were probably likely to do a deal. You got a good manager. Long story short, bought the stock in the low $10 range. They announced- an How long ago was that? 
uh, just a couple weeks ago. Oh, okay. So early really August. Just before the, uh, the yeah. pop then. Sometimes okay. in investing, you just got to get lucky, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I bought it. And then just two or three weeks later, the acquisition was announced that they're going to acquire a company called Desktop Metal, which is a VC funded company with some really interesting backers, including uh, Lux Capital and uh, even Chamath of the um, social capital fame. He's actually investing in the deal as well. A bunch of famous VCs involved. And it's a 3D printing business said to be one of the leaders in the next generation of 3D printing where they're going to be so good that you can print metal parts and all kinds of composite parts for things like the aerospace industry or the EV electric vehicle industry. So pretty interesting, small revenue base today, 26 million, but they expect to grow to a billion dollars of revenue in five years. Nice. Big plans. So are you, are you going to hold this one then as an investment or is this like a shorter term trade or what are you thinking? Because had a big gap up. Yeah. So I, I am probably going to take a little bit of profit. I was kind of waiting to see uh, as the deal gets closer to being done, if the share price will keep rising. But you know, it's kind of like a VC investment still at this stage. They didn't acquire a mature business. They acquired a what I would consider to be still somewhat of a VC style bet. Yeah. So for me, I just want to make that a relatively small position in my portfolio. So I'll probably take a little bit of gains off the table. It's not up a ton, about 20% from where I bought it, 15, 20%. Probably take a little bit of gains out and then let the rest ride and see if this desktop metal can really do what they think they can do over the next few years. Nice. So the whole SPAC thing is basically like a public version of the search fund. Yeah. It sounds like. Exactly. You know, so, so a search fund is basically you know, uh, entrepreneurship by acquisition, right? You have some like a uh, couple of guys that get together, they raise a few million bucks and they go buy a boring company. Like my buddy, I just invested in his search fund where they just acquired a moving company, right? They do a few million bucks in EBITDA every year and they're looking to scale that up and maybe grow that into an, a national brand, right? So you raise a few million, you go out, you buy a company, and then you use really smart people to scale that up and you could turn that little investment into mm -hmm. significant gains if they're able to get traction. Yeah. So you're really like betting on the horse and now they're doing that same style in the public market. So it's pretty interesting that you can do that both in private mm -hmm. and public. Yeah, because yeah, you have to be an accredited and accredited investor with a lot of the stuff that you guys do. Yeah, so the private is, rounds are just regular Reg D rounds usually. And this is, opens it up to anybody that has a brokerage account. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there are a lot of interesting dynamics too with SPACs that we won't go into today. There's things like warrants, which are basically options on SPACs you can buy that have like higher return but higher risk potential. SPACs can do bad deals, so you can actually lose money if they go acquire something that's a crappy company and it can trade below where you bought it at. But yeah, a lot of yeah, there's of, still risk to it, for right? Sure. Yeah, but, but it's it's just a unique way of like acquiring and 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 getting into good positions, I guess. I'm pretty excited though about the SPAC explosion because even though I think there's probably now maybe a little bit too much capital chasing chasing deals that does mean that some amount of these SPACs are gonna take some interesting businesses public. So as a public market stock investor, mm. I'm excited there's gonna be a lot more, more fresh companies coming public yeah. via SPACs. I guess that's another thing we can talk about too is the IPO like kind of, uh, I guess, wave that's that's hit us. Like IPOs were relatively quiet for a while it and now we've got a bunch of so stuff coming. so fast, I have like, Seven S ones to look at. So <laughs> I don't even know. I what, what, so which ones S1s. are you more most excited about? I still, I, I haven't even had a chance to really dive in. Travis is going to be way more informed on the IPOs. For so. sure. I mean, just even last week, there were like four or five that looked kind of interesting. Snowflake, which is a, a big data warehousing company that's absolutely been crushing it over the last few years. That one's interesting. We'll see what valuation looks like, but definitely a very fundamentally good company filed an S1 to go public. You've got Palantir, the secretive security software company that is doing a direct listing. Yep. You've got Asana, which is a product management and a productivity software company. You can think of it kind of like an Atlassian competitor along those lines. And so that one filed an S1. There's several others that I think people are excited about as well. What do you guys think of Airbnb? Oh, duh. Yeah, the big one. <laughs> the <biggest laughs> you know, what what are you guys bullish bearish, you know, assuming like don't even think about the valuation of the IPO, How yeah. can I just not? of the business. What do you guys think? I I'm, I'm bullish. Yeah. I, I am think too. I think it's a very well-managed company. I think they have a lot of interesting longer-term opportunities to grow the business outside the pandemic once all that's past them. Especially with more people buying houses. Um 
more people may want to do short-term rentals with their homes yep. for various reasons. Mm -hmm. I guess the only thing to think about is if cities start to regulate that, kind of like they did in, in some places where you had to get permits and, you know, some um, c communities may not allow for short-term rentals. Stuff like that could affect yeah. their ability to grow. But overall, yeah, I'm bullish on Airbnb. I feel like the supply demand curve has kind of shifted with Airbnb from the early days. Like I remember what, like seven or eight years ago when Airbnb was first becoming a thing, we were traveling around the world and like we did Airbnbs in Europe and Africa and, and Asia. And it was like very easy to find really high quality places for reasonable prices for longer periods of time. Like you could book a beautiful condo in a hot zone for a, for half the price of a hotel and you could get it for two to three weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, when I've been searching and granted we're in the, the COVID era right mm -hmm. now, so there's more demand for them. But even outside of it, I've just noticed it's become harder to find availability of high quality stuff at good prices. So I think there is more, de way more demand than there was in the early days. And like people have actually made businesses out of trying to buy a bunch of properties and just use them as Airbnb rentals. Yeah. I think some of those people may have gotten hurt pretty bad in the spring. They were really, they were really close to going under a lot of those uh, yeah. homeowners that had multiple properties. Yeah. But leveraged thank up. goodness. Yeah. They were leveraged up and thank goodness things kind of turned around as people needed to get the hell out of their houses. And yeah. sure enough, Airbnb was there to fulfill that need. Yeah. One of the parts of the business uh, that I'm pretty bullish on that I've experienced personally that I think is probably maybe being overlooked right now, but I think will continue to be a big business going forward is the experiences, Airbnb experiences business where they, they help you to book fun stuff. Once you're on vacation, you have your, your house booked and everything. They're like, okay, now uh, you want to take a pasta cooking class with a local. Do you want to go on a sightseeing tour? Do you want to, mm -hmm. you know, do yeah. some outdoor hikes with a local? Those kinds of things I've enjoyed as I've done a few through Airbnb prior to the pandemic. And that, I would call them the leader in the experiences business along with TripAdvisor, probably right there with them in terms of size. But that potentially longer term when we return to normalcy in society, I think will continue to be a really bright spot for them. What experience did you do? I actually did a cooking class in Italy, which was awesome. Nice. And I've done, I've done a few of them now. Yeah, what else have I done? Did a sailing trip on a sailboat. Um, and that was really cool. What cool. else? I, yeah. I haven't booked any through that. No Airbnb experiences. Yeah. I just had a random thought. So, what if Airbnb bought TripAdvisor? Yeah, absolutely. So that they could have the rent, the restaurant and the hotel kind of market too. Just a thought. I don't yeah. know. They would become immediately they would be huge. as big as booking probably. Yeah. yeah. Bigger. And then it'd be booking versus Airbnb. Yep. <laughs> and then where does Yelp fall in all that? Oh, uh, I don't know. Wah, <laughs> Yelp is. Wah, wah. Where's the thing where we hit? I don't know. Poor Yelp. Wah. Yelp's. Uh, I don't know. Let's yeah. see how they've been doing. I, oh, I, not so good. I honestly do love Yelp, but I just don't know if it's gonna if it's gonna make it. Are they in trouble? I haven't I haven't looked at their fundamentals. Have you guys? I haven't looked at their fundamentals. I haven't in a looked long at while. their fundamentals. I'm just going based off like my experiences and yeah. just what I use. I mean, I think it's still useful, a useful app, but yeah, Google reviews is kind of filling that need now. And, and between it, TripAdvisor- there a big point of contention with Google, like trying to rank their own reviews higher than Yelp. And, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then also like Yelp has really angered a lot of their own SMB customers by kind of strong arm, arming them into paying for the more services from Yelp and- you know, that's Yelp just trying to make their business work, but a lot of their own customers, SMBs don't even like them. And I know in some of their niches, like home improvement categories, you've got companies like Home Advisor and Angie's List competing against Yelp pretty mm -hmm. heavily. So Open Table yeah. is competing against Yelp for restaurant reviews. And yeah, Open Table's owned by Booking, I believe now. So mm -hmm. yeah, they, they have had a rough go of it, I believe for the last few years, but yeah. Well, look, I mean, travel is definitely an interesting space right now because obviously international travel for a lot of people is cut off. Domestic travel, we talked about this last week, is kicking ass, RV sales, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, people aren't going to stop traveling long term. I, I think maybe we could get a rebound in some of these markets. Like yeah. what areas are you guys bullish on, bearish on specifically to travel? 
You know, I've been thinking about this a lot and I, I, I've noticed the savings, the personal savings rate is high. It's, I think in the U S yeah, it's yeah. pretty darn high. Um, is which, it the highest it's ever been? I think it, I think so, but I'd have to double check that. Yeah. There's a lot of extra savings that Americans have that they just weren't used to having. And I imagine that's going to burn a hole in many people's pockets. Right. I think there's going to be a lot of pent up demand for travel. And I am starting to think about things like the airlines, the cruise lines, the airlines are kind of a bit sketchy for me still, but maybe yeah. like a solid airline, like Southwest or something or Delta, maybe uh, or Delta. Maybe um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about the cruise lines a little bit, even though they have a lot of debt. Um, I think that's, that might be a riskier play too, but longer term people, I think people are going to cruise again. I think, I think people forget. Yeah. They, they forget history quickly. Yeah. And once life kind of starts to feel normal again and vaccine comes and cases are down, whatever, I think people are going to get back to their normal lives. Well, and anecdotally, we know several people that already have cruises booked for well, next year. Yeah, which right? is wild. And I guess they, <laughs> well, they they probably have like an open cancellation policy, but like I'd imagine the cruise lines are like, yeah. we got to get as many future bookings as possible just to show that we're not dead <laughs> yeah yeah so far the data suggested that the bookings into 2021 and through the end of this year have been pretty strong actually and obviously the cruise lines have been probably offering some deals to get that but it looks like bookings have rapidly rebounded for a lot of these cruise lines yeah i'm just thinking there could be a short squeeze play here maybe yeah i don't know or is the short interest on cruise lines heavy? oh yeah it's starting to grow yeah Interesting. So. I, I know I don't want to go on a cruise no. anytime soon. And not because of COVID, but I think cruises are fucking well, lame. So. We're, 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 we've never been like cruisers, yeah. but people that want to cruise, they, they love it. want to cruise. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. I just think people are going to get out. They're going to want to spend money. They're going to want to party. And Oh, yeah. All, like you said, uh, yeah. pent up demand. Like Pent-up. people have been. I've been daydreaming about international <laughs> travel again. Oh, yeah. We've got friends over in Bali that are just laughing at us saying you guys are, you know, you know good luck. We're, ha- we're hanging out, having a good time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know. So, yes, the travel sector definitely is intriguing to me, but I just the timing needs to be right. Yeah. OK, cool. Because yeah. of the risk. Yeah, before the pandemic, travel was such a hot category. The idea of experiences over things had really become a big movement. Yeah. The, the movement of people across the globe was easier than ever. It's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out over the next two or three years as yeah. things kind of normalize. What does the new normal look like? Yeah. Yeah, eventually, I, I'm, I'm bullish on it. I mean, we're, people aren't going to stop traveling. Yeah, I mean, I this don't is think so. A year, two, three, five years from now, people are gonna be like, "COVID, what?" Yeah, you what know? pandemic? It's gonna be interesting though because uh, we have had a couple airline bankruptcies globally. Uh, in the U.S., all the major airlines uh, seem to be making it through okay. They have a significant amount of liquidity on their balance sheet, but we're already starting to see talk of more furloughs slash layoffs from some of the major U.S. airlines because even though the numbers have been slowly improving for them, they're still going to be up at like 50 or 60% capacity by the end of the year, which is a level where most of them still don't make money. So in the near term, it's a really weird picture where airlines still look like they might be in trouble and we might end up with a shortage of planes in two years because we've got airline bankruptcies or airlines take a lot of capacity out. And then when that wave of demand, demand returns, prices just go boom yeah like that's what i'm more concerned about i hope about. that doesn't happen yeah because yeah. isn't business class and first class that's where they actually make their profit yeah right and if business travel doesn't rebound like you know uh people on vacation yeah uh that could cause an interesting dynamic because they're gonna have to squeeze people in economy for more money yeah or what could happen what's likely to happen i would think just thinking through that problem is they remove some of the during the week schedules where business travel would typically fill that. Mm. And so they remove the planes from service during the week, but on the weekend, all that leisure travel pin up demand, they maybe add some capacity there. And in that case, maybe people have to pay up for the business class seats because all the economy seats are sold out. I don't know. It will be interesting. Not yeah. to mention everyone's racking up air miles right now because they can't spend them. <laughs> yeah. yeah so right. maybe, yeah, that. That could be in another interesting dynamic. They'll be like, I'm going to get first class with my air miles. That's you know? a very good point. True. true. I don't yeah. know. Cool. Well, what questions do we have this week? Um, well, 
Uh, let's look at that real quick. Yeah, I'm going to let you pull that up. I, I was being lazy today and <laughs> didn't pull pull up the questions. By the way, guys, for you watching on YouTube or listening to the podcast, go to wetalkmoney.com and you can submit a question directly and we will possibly pull it up and answer it here on yes, the show. Yes, submit so. questions, guys. Yeah. Okay, um, what do you think about investing in companies like Fundrise? Oh, that's right. You did mention that one. So Fundrise is basically crowdsourcing. It's It's... There, there's a few companies like this. I personally am not invested. I think it's interesting. Um, it definitely comes with risk. If you look at w either on the crypto side, tokenized real estate, or on the traditional side, companies like Fundrise, basically what you can do is as a smaller investor, you can invest in bigger real estate projects, or you can lend directly to one person or one project or many projects. And uh, I know, you know, they have a pretty robust affiliate program. So there's a lot of people that have done content around this, mm -hmm. both saying how they love it so much. And some people that are heavily critical of it, but if you look at their annualized returns, I mean, they're, they're pretty good. Um, you just really have to make sure that you understand the risks associated with this. And you can see, I mean, there's everything from commercial real estate to single family real estate to multifamily apartments, um, really anything that you want to invest in. I mean, it's, it's such a wide variety of projects that are offered. Um, I prefer to know the people that I'm investing in. Um, I'm also interested in the kind of the tokenized version of this. Uh, but I think it's interesting. And if you don't have any exposure to real estate, this could be an interesting kind of lower cost, lower investment way to get involved. I love the fundamental idea behind it, you know, which is making a lot of this real estate asset class available to smaller investors, because yeah. typically with real estate, it's a large transaction size, especially if you're talking about commercial real estate, most yeah. individuals don't have that kind of capital. And if you do, you might invest in one deal and you're not diversified, but if you could invest a little bit in a bunch of different real estate projects, I've always thought that's a fundamental idea that should exist. So I yeah. hope they succeed. Or, or like you said, perhaps, you know, the, the movement behind tokenizing real estate, I'm, I'm hoping one or both of those succeed. Yeah. I think they'll kind of merge together over time. Yeah. What, what else do we have? Um, we also got the question, um, about will, if I start trading, will that complicate my taxes? Oh, interesting. Uh, Rocky, AKA crypto hustle would love to chime in on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and also anybody else that made a shit ton of money in, in crypto over the past few years knows like, yes, trading absolutely will complicate <laughs> yeah. your taxes. And if you make a lot of money, you better know how much you owe because there were yeah. several people I know from the two seven, 2017 boom that made millions and went bankrupt because they didn't think about taxes. Mm -hmm. So you better think about taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, uh, something like trading, you've got things like your cost basis in the stock and then what you sell it for and you have a pr profit or a loss and, you know, all of this gets tracked and all of it has to be tracked on your taxes. So, yes, it, it does make it a little more complicated and add another element to it. But you get tax forms at the end of the year from your brokerage accounts that outline everything for you. You have access to look at your buys and sells. So as long as you're not like day trading or trading a ton um, and you, you don't have too many transactions, it, it doesn't have to be that overwhelming. Right. If you are day trading, then that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic. And there are some nuances with that and there are elections you can make on your taxes to uh, be seen as a day trader with the IRS. And it changes how um, you can basically do your profit and loss on yep. and be a business. And then futures are taxed differently than if Futures equities. are taxed differently than equities. Futures are taxed part long-term capital gain, part short-term uh, capital gain. So yeah, they're, yes, Things it's like complicated. Wash sales. <laughs> wash sale rules. Like yeah. Long-term versus short-term, knowing that. Uh, you dividends. Could, you could even have in a good year when you have a lot of gains, you could even get pushed into a higher income tax bracket by your trading gains. Absolutely. That's another thing that can be a big mm -hmm. deal. And yeah. that's why I'm always talking tax strategy, tax strategy, and I teach it because, you know, if you are doing that, you want to be aware of that because if you're going to push yourself into a higher tax bracket and you're going to have not, you know, higher 
higher capital gains tax or whatever it might might be if it's short term long term um you could strategize that a little bit and maybe wait and sell you might be at the end of the year maybe wait and sell your stock next year you yeah. know or little t little things like that can kind of help you really strategize your tax situation i actually screwed up on a crypto trade where i made a really big percentage gain and i think i sold it like two weeks before the cut off oh so yeah like that's right. a mistake yeah oh, yeah but i yes. mean you can't control when markets move and i wasn't thinking taxes yeah and i'm gonna owe a lot more than i would have otherwise had i held on For prices you know in hindsight it's easy to go oh prices stayed the same but <laughs> during that move i was like okay i gotta take profit yeah and then only looking back at my my records was I like, oh shit, I was almost at long-term gain yeah. levels. And you know, it can make a big difference. If you're in a high tax bracket, like if you're in the 35 to 37% tax bracket and you're looking at a short-term cap gain, you know, you're gonna get taxed at those higher tax brackets. If you just wait just a little bit longer or strategize that a little differently, you could get into a 20% yeah. uh, long-term capital gains rate. Which, which effectively means you've got 18% to work with yeah. You could be down if you wait two weeks, but you know, the asset goes down 10%. You're still ahead actually, because the tax that you save is more than the amount it went down exactly. yeah. while you waited. Yep. But, <laughs> so I yeah, screwed up. It's, it's, I made a mistake. Oh, it's well. okay. I, I'll also say too, like, you know, with, with stocks and stuff, it's usually a l little more simple because you have brokerage statements and it, it, it's usually not as diversified with crypto. It gets complicated very quickly because if you have multiple exchanges that you're trading through and you're going from, you know, online exchange, I don't even want to talk about like, it. Yeah, transferring <laughs> wallets, flipping into different coins. Yeah. It gives me anxiety. Just even talking about it. freaks about me it. out too. It's so obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I hope, in the future, there's a simpler way to do it. But right now, it's just a fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, what else we got? Um, I mean, that's pretty much all I had. But okay. is there anything that you guys can think of? I've been getting a ton of questions from the community about uh, DEXs, you know, all the, all this, the, the new hype of like yield farming and stuff like that. So next week, we'll dive more into that. I have a ton of questions based on that. Um, but, uh, we won't go down. I want to learn about that too. I mean, yeah. there's so much in, on the DeFi side that I still have to learn. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. Like I'm never in a rush to learn this stuff or to implement it because when you, when you FOMO into stuff or when you get into investments without truly understanding what it's about, that's where you actually expose yourself to way more unnecessary risk than you should. So I would just encourage people like that are asking all these questions, which are great questions. It's like, just take your time. Don't feel FOMO just because you see the price of certain markets going up, like develop your skills, develop your strategy, allocate your capital the right way. Think about risk, do all the boring shit first. And then the sexy stuff will happen eventually, <laughs> right? There's always another trade. There's always innovation. Yeah. There's always a, another SPAC or another, you know, DeFi, uh, thing you know yield farming scheme of some sort yeah there's almost never a shortage of opportunities out there in investing mm -mm. you know there are times that are quieter than others but you know there's rarely does a six or 12 month period go by where i don't have at least one to two very compelling opportunities yeah and in years like this the number of opportunities explodes yeah you can't even keep up with it all yeah but it's yeah, awesome. very, very good advice. Like my brother even was asking me, you know, he's like, oh, I've got some extra capital now. Like, what can I buy today? I'm like, maybe just pump the brakes for a minute. You yeah. don't have to buy anything today. Yeah. Let's let's think about what makes sense. What's in your portfolio? What are your position sizes? And then let's maybe go and look at yeah. some ideas. But flat is a position too. It's right? okay to have some cash on the sidelines, especially if you're more of an active investor. I mean, yeah. That's what you need to be able to pounce when the opportunity comes. Yep. Yeah. That's a good place to leave it. All right. Awesome. Well, uh, guys, again, go to wetalkmoney.com, submit a question for the show, and uh, it's good to be back in the studio with you guys. Thanks again for Thank joining you. us. Absolutely. And, uh, and don't forget to check out our community. Skillincubator.com. We'll link that up as well if you guys want to invest with us or learn how to uh, dive into these markets uh, in a little more, I guess, educated way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Knowledge is power. That's right. <laughs> awesome. All, All right. right, guys. Well, thanks for watching or listening, and uh, we'll see you next time.